Okay, welcome, great crowd. Let's start. Okay, so today we're going to take a look at um, DNA discovery and structure, uh, but we're also going to take a look. Just I'm going to share my whole screen. Um, we're going to take a look at DNA discovery and structure and DNA replication, and give you guys your first official question work from past papers that you need to do, which we will be busy with tomorrow. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just quickly go back to my Google Classroom. I just want to show you a few things on the Google Classroom. Now, please note that yesterday, the lessons for yesterday, the lesson, the, the physical Zoom lesson I did with you yesterday is now loaded onto the Google Classroom. So there's intro into life sciences break 12. That's about two minutes. And the DNA code of life, that's the rest of the lesson. And so those are the lessons I recorded yesterday. And every time I, I record a lesson, that is what I do. I place it under that lesson so that I know in future when everything's together. So when I pre-record a lesson or when I record a lesson during Zoom, I'm going to place it under that specific lesson. So you guys can go and watch it again afterwards. And then also note again, there's the Mind the Gap book that you need to use uh, for notes at the moment. Also, um, I've got there, there's the life uh, lesson two for DNA and discovery, which we're gonna do today. And again, I'm gonna put the recorded lesson that I'm recording now, I'm gonna put that under that lesson and probably maybe put it under lesson two or lesson three, we'll see how it's gonna work out. And this is going to be your first work for lesson three. There's a past paper and you need to answer the, the questions that are listed over here. That's the questions that you need to answer from that past paper that are placed over there. And then also please note that under each lesson, I've got some videos. Guys, you need to go watch those videos, those animations because I illustrate them in a way that I cannot illustrate them to you. And so for better understanding and to see and to visualize and get the images of how it works into your head, you need to actually go and watch those videos as well. Don't leave anything. Anything that I place in Google Classroom is gonna be of use to you. There's nothing that you can say, but please ignore this, but please ignore that. Um, I'm trying not to post too many things to overwhelm you guys, but I'm trying to give you just enough so that it doesn't overwhelm you, but gives you enough resources and especially things like videos I'm posting. Please go and watch those videos. Okay, let's start with the lesson. Okay, so today we're going to talk about DNA discovery. Um, sorry, I don't know why the side of my screen is not opening quickly. Okay, so DNA discovery and structure. We discussed a little bit about DNA structure yesterday. We're going to go into more detail on that today. And in terms of DNA discovery, they love asking short questions. But when I get to that section, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you the basic type of um, question that they normally ask with regards to that. Now, we already talked about the location of DNA yesterday. We said the location of DNA is inside the nucleus, but there's also some inside the mitochondrion, and there's also some inside the chloroplast, if, you're a plant, if you have plant cells, but you don't have plant cells. In plant cells, there's also inside the chloroplasts. Then, we need to know that DNA makes up the genes and the chromosomes. Um, and then that's your nuclear DNA. And then it's also present in the mitochondria, as I said to you. We're going to go through a brief history of the discovery of the structure of the molecule. And we're going to discuss four main people. That's going to be important for your progression. Now, I'm mentioning more people within this section of work, please. The four people that you need to know about is Watson and Crick, um, 
Um, and Franklin and Wilkins, those are the four people that we're going to discuss. Rosalind Franklin, um, and um, then of course, Watson and Crick, uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. And then the three components of the DNA nucleotide you need to know about. You need to know that nitrogenous bases are linked by weak hydrogen bonds together, and that they always link up in pairs. Adenine always connects to thymine. That's going to be important for you guys. Adenine is going to link up to thymine. Be a justice. Adenine to thymine and cytosine to guanine. Adenine to thymine. I think my battery is flat on my pen. Sorry about that. And cytosine to guanine. And that's important for the structure. So there's pairing of the bases. Um, adenine A to thymine T and guanine cytosine g to c and that's always going to be connecting that way and then there's also a, on, a, on a nucleotide there's going to be a sugar portion in the case of dna it's going to be a deoxyribose and there's always uh, there's also a phosphate portion to any nucleotide but we'll get to that in a moment okay then we also want to know uh it's important for you to know that the natural shape of the DNA molecule is a double helix, so it's a double strand, and it's wound, wound up onto a helix, okay, it's wound up onto a helix, and then you need to be able to interpret the stick diagram of the DNA molecule to illustrate its structure. You actually did that yesterday uh, when you had to make the drawing of the DNA molecule from the mind to gap book. You need to know the functions of DNA. Um, DNA together, a few nucleotides together, make up what we call a gene, and that uh, carry, carries hereditary information. Um, so it carries information that is passed on from parents to, uh, to children, to offspring. And then DNA contains coded information for protein synthesis. So DNA detects our proteins are going to look inside the cell, inside your body, and you are basically uh, mostly proteins. You are made up out of proteins mostly. And so your DNA determines what those proteins look like. Okay, then let's get into the discovery of DNA. Okay, so James Watson, Francis Crick, uh, they proposed the double helix structure of DNA in 1953. Um, but there's various other scientists that made it, when they got to the discovery in 1953, um, there's various previous uh, research that was done uh, for them to be able to know what DNA should look like. And so, they stood on the shoulders of giants when they made this discovery because there's previous people that did work with regards to um, DNA and it's how it works. Now, one of those first people, we are also gonna discuss with him in a little more detail later this year, is Gregor Mendel. And when we do Mendelian genetics, that's who we are talking about, Gregor Mendel. Now he was a, um, he was um, a priest, um, and he didn't. He had had too much time on his hands, and so uh, he, yes. Sorry, uh, didn't we do this yesterday? No, we didn't do this yesterday. No. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so I, de I definitely did not do this yesterday. You did DNA introduction yesterday, but I never got into the, the complete structure. We discussed some of the structure yesterday. Uh, I never discussed any of the, um, of the history behind the structure, or and I, they, I haven't discussed the, the specifics of the structure yet. Okay, okay. so Greg Mendel, he was, um, he, he played around with in his garden with pea plants. And pea plants have different features that either goes the one way or goes the other way. Uh, one of those things is the, the color of the peas. Uh, another thing is the, the shape of the, 
the pea uh, pods, whether they are wrinkled or smooth. Another one is the color of the flower of the pea. So every time when we took a look at one of these features, it had two distinct ways it could go. In this case, what we say, see over here is either the peas could have been green or the peas were yellow. Most of the times the peas were yellow, but other times they were green. And depending on this, he knew that certain factors were passed on from a generation to the next generation. But we'll discuss those genetics in a later section of work, okay? Um, and then he said, but these characteristics are controlled by what he calls genes. Okay, then um, these, this, this person you don't really want to, don't really have to remember, but he just identifies DNA as a source of genes. Hello? Yes. Is there a question? Guys, can, can I ask? If you've got questions, put it in the chat box. And during the lesson, I will try and take a look at the chat box um, and then answer questions as we go along. I might not answer immediately, but um, at least at the end of the lesson, I will go back to the chat box and see, is there any questions? And we'll discuss those questions, okay? People, then in 1920, uh, scientists believe that genes consist out of proteins. They were incorrect. They later discovered there's more to, to genes than, or to DNA than just proteins. Okay. So in 1928, Frederick Griffith, you don't need to remember his name, states that genes consist of DNA and not proteins. So he says, no, it's DNA. And it's not proteins. And DNA has got a protein portion, but it's not just protein. In 1944, Oswald Avery, who you don't also oh, have guys, to... Oh, guys, we're going to learn about child development today. We're child development? Yeah. Okay, just give me a second, guys. Try not watching cartoons while... Hello? Try not watching cartoons while um, we're busy with the lesson in the first place. And secondly, try and stay muted. I mute you when you come in. Um, try and put your questions in the chat box, please. Okay. Now, people. So, um, he supports Griffith in saying DNA is uh, the hereditary molecule, which means that DNA passes genes on. Genes are saying that it passes characteristics from one generation to the next uh, uh, generation. So char physical characteristics, for example. And then in 1949, Erwin Chagall says he determines that there's an equal amount of adenine and there's an equal amount. Guys, switch off your video as well because it takes some of the streaming. Um, it actually delays the whole thing because it, what it does is that it takes more data if you switch your video on. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now, People, he determines that there's an equal amount of adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. Now, remember, I told you that adenine and thymine, they go together. They connect together. Guanine and cytosine connect together. And that's going to be very important for DNA structure and the way that it works. So that discovery was essential for, um, for Watson and Crick to be able to say that... That's Guys, I don't know who this is, but you guys are starting to be, I'm going to check next time. You are starting to be very rude. Whoever that is, it's not on. Please stop it now. Do not unmute yourself. Please go watch your cartoon and stop bothering and coming into my lesson and playing your cartoon. Um, in a moment, I'm going to then also, if, if that happens again, I'm going to kick you off the lesson. Please don't let that happen. Okay, so adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine, they, the same amounts in the DNA molecule. It's because they connect up together. And that helped Francis and Crick to know that it's a double helix instead of a triple helix when they took a look at the DNA structure. 
Okay, now, here is where it gets, the history gets really interesting because this is quite, um, it's sad. Um, it's got a little bit of suspense to it, this, uh, the, the, this part of the story of how DNA was discovered. Now, here's Rosalind Franklin, beautiful lady. Now, she takes an x-ray photo of DNA and what she sees is this. And by seeing this, she knows that, hi, DNA is a helix. It's curled up into a helix. And, and so, uh, if, but she doesn't know, is this a double or is this a triple helix? And so the person in charge of her um, uh, was Professor Maurice Walton. And he shows the picture without her permission. He shows the picture to James Watson and Francis Crick. Um, and then by taking a look at her picture, they say, oh, but the DNA is a double helix because now she, they have the information from Irwin Chocolat to say that adenine and thymine are equal amounts and cytosine and guanine are equal amounts. And so they know it's a double helix because if it was a triple helix, there won't be the same amounts of these substances. There, it will be an odd number if it was a, a, a triple helix. So now they know it's a double helix because of the picture and because of Irwin Chogarth saying that adenine and thymine connect together, cytosine and guanine connect together. And so they actually win the Nobel Prize in 1958 for this discovery. But unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin doesn't get the Nobel Prize. Franklin, Watson, as well as Wilkins get the Nobel Prize. But unfortunately, the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously after one's death. Um, and unfortunately, she died before that um, at the age of 37, before the Nobel Prize was awarded. And um, unfortunately, she died of cancer. And she probably died of cancer because of the x-rays that she was exposed to. People didn't know the, um, that x-rays caused cancer in those days. And it's actually quite ir ironic because Cancer is actually a mutation on DNA that she was busy studying, and it was caused by the x-rays that she took the pictures with. So it's quite ironic um, in the way that she died, and she actually never even received for her discoveries the Nobel Prize with the, the other gentlemen on this, um, in this section. Okay, but James Watson is still alive. He's... Um, uh, in 1990, they, they started the Human Genome Project, and they're actually decoding the whole code of the human DNA. And by 2003, that was, uh, that was done. They know the whole human uh, DNA or code that they can decode. Okay, so let's talk about the structure of DNA very quickly. Guys, structure of DNA, it's a giant molecule. It's very long. It's twisted into a double strand. Uh, so it's what we call a double helix. It's a ladder structure that is, uh, that is twisted around. It's almost two meters long, but coiled up into, to put into the cell. And it's a polymer consisting out of the monomers called nucleotides. Each nucleotide consists, now you don't need to know that structure. Please don't go and memorize that. You just need to know that each one of the nucleotides consists of a phosphate, consists out of a sugar portion and a nitrogenous base, which is either A, C, C, or G in the case of DNA. In the case of RNA, it's actually A, uh, U, C, and G. So U replaces T in RNA. Okay, so adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Okay, adenine and guanine are larger. They are called purine bases, and cytosine and thymine are called pyrimidine bases, and they tend to be smaller. Okay, so there's your different 
Um, we're only have 10 minutes left, so we're not going to get to lesson three today. So we'll have to have another lesson tomorrow uh, for lesson three before, and then we'll have to do the homework over the weekend, people. So deoxyribose com um, uh, combines to a phosphate group. Um, so there's the phosphate group, there's the deoxyribose sugar, and then you have your four different bases connected to that. And you can see that A is going to fit into T and that G is going to fit into C. So they fit together. And they fit together like this, where we have a phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone. There's your sugars and your phosphates backbone. And you have the nitrogenous bases in the middle. And you can see over here that the nitrogenous bases connect together up. Now those bonds, those red bonds over there, those are called um, hydrogen bonds. They're hydrogen bonds. And there's two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. And there's three hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine. And that's why we have the base pairing because of either two bonds or three bonds formed. And that's why we always have the same amount of guanine as cytosine because they connect together on opposite sides of the string and then thymine and adenine connect together on opposite sides of the string. Okay, so there's your base pairing in more detail, just a larger uh, image of the previous one. Okay, now these little bases are repeated many times. And each uh, base will then form a code, and each three codes is going to code for an amino acid. Each three nucleotides with its different bases uh, will, will code for a specific amino acid in, in a protein. Okay. That we also, because they connect A to C and T to G, we say that the strand is complementary. So basically what we're saying to you is that we, and you'll see that in when we do replication, is that if I use one strand, I can actually duplicate the other one. What does DNA do? It carries the genetic code for making proteins. Um, the gene is a short section of DNA that um, codes for a specific protein and, or, or sequence, um, and that codes for amino acids, and that amino acid sequence combined to form a protein. Now, only 2% of DNA actually codes for proteins. The rest, we used to call it junk DNA, the rest actually codes for nothing. But there is purposes behind uh, the, the junk DNA. It actually controls the expression of the, the rest of the DNA that codes for something. It also protects the DNA against harmful mutations and it controls the copying of genes during transcription in protein synthesis. So a lot of the DNA actually doesn't physically code for any proteins. About 98% doesn't code for anything. Okay, let's take a look. There is a question in the chat box. Good morning, sir. Can you please upload the video lesson on Google Classroom? I did say at the beginning of the lesson, I will do that. I will do that. I always do that. So I will upload it under lesson two today. I already uploaded lesson one from yesterday in lesson one on Google Classroom. And so when the cell is divided um, and the chromatin network shortens and coils into chromosomes, is a chromosome that contains, uh, the chromosomes contain some genetic information. And that's a nice, that's a very, very nice question. Thank you, Tenzile. A very good question. Yes, it still codes. It still codes for the proteins. It's still got the code when it becomes a chromosome. Um, we duplicate that code before it becomes chromosomes, but no, it cannot go into protein synthesis while it's inside a chromosome. And you'll see when we do the vision, uh, when we're going to go through meiosis and we do the vision, when it's in the chromosome, I can't. I can't do any protein synthesis. Um, pro protein synthesis can only happen when the DNA is in the nucleolus and chromatin network form. 
when it's in the chromosome, it's not going to code for any proteins at that stage. It's not going to form any proteins at that stage. Um, it needs to unwind again and form the nucleolus and the chromatin network before, it can, uh, before we can read the code again. It's like putting a chromosome is like putting whatever is in that filing cabinet, like putting it in a briefcase and locking the briefcase, carrying the briefcase to somewhere else, and I can only read what's in the briefcase once I open the briefcase again and I unpack whatever is inside the briefcase. A very nice question. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I'm going to just hold on for a moment. Um, I'm also going to give you guys a chance if you want to place any questions in the chat box, please place them in the chat box now so I can answer. Um, at this stage, it is at the end of the lesson for lesson two. We'll have another lesson on lesson three tomorrow. Um, but at this stage, because I'm f physically finished with the lesson, only a few minutes left. If you want to unmute and ask a question, you're more than welcome to. Uh, sir? Yes. So, like, um, you see the ribosome, is it what, like, codes the DNA? No, the ribosome doesn't code the DNA. The, the ribosome is a, like a construction site for protein. So, what's going to happen is, in a few lessons time, I think it's lesson four or lesson five, we're going to discuss protein synthesis, and you're going to see that uh, there's going to be a, an RNA called messenger RNA that's going to take the code from the DNA, it's going to go out of the nucleus. It's going to go to the cytoplasm. It's going to go to the ribosome. And it's going to sit on the ribosome and then collect the bricks that we built the proteins with, collect the amino acids that we built the proteins with. And so the ribosome is like a construction site for proteins. So, but in, in, from, from the DNA to the ribosome, there's going to be an RNA that's going to carry the message from the one to the other. Nice question. So the RNA, so the RNA is the only like um, thing that like goes out and does whatever. DNA is too big to go out. DNA is too big to go out, so it never goes out. The RNA carries the message from the DNA um, and carries it to the ribosome. Okay, thank you, sir. We still got two minutes left for questions. Okay. So, okay, we're not gonna, we're gonna do DNA replication tomorrow. We don't have enough time. Thank you, um, Casual, for the question. Um, we're going to finish DNA replication tomorrow. Um, I thought we'll have time today to finish that, but time caught up with us. And as Zoom is 40 minutes, I don't want to make it more than the 40 minutes. So DNA replication will be discussed tomorrow in tomorrow's lesson. And then I will give you the work that you need to do after that for DNA replication. Okay. Mutations is when there's a change in the code. Now, I told you that the code consists out of those nitrogenous bases in a sequence, A, C, T, G, 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 C, C, A, A, T, 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 G. Now, if one of those goes wrong, if one of those is, and you'll see that in replication, if one of those are replicated wrong and falls in the incorrect sequence, in the incorrect place in the code, then that causes the proteins to be different. And those are what mutations are. Very good uh, question. Okay, Lalitha is also asking, how does RNA make mistakes in genetics? Also the same way. It reads the code wrong. Sometimes the wrong A, C, U, or G sits in the wrong place, and that's how RNA can make mistakes in genetics. Okay, so that's also a, a mutation that happens. And when that happens, it changes the protein that is supposed to be produced. And that causes then... Um, our mistakes happen in genetics. Guys, we've got less than a minute left. I'm not going to restart the lesson when that minute is over. 
Uh, so it's automatically going to kick us out. Any more questions you can ask? I'll try 